Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. Welcome dear learners to the another session of international business management. Today we will talk about the various international trade theories. I am Dr. Manisha Goswami, Assistant Professor at Institute of Business Management, GLA University, Matra. So before we begin with the next lecture, lecture number 9, let's review what we did in our lecture number 8. In during that lecture, we talked about the various regional blocks. We are try to understand what are the different levels of the integration right? and how these different level of integration are actually facilitating the trade across the globe. What was the impact of such integration on the growth of the economy? Maybe it is a developing country or developed nation, there was no discrimination on the basis of the economy. The people start forming the blocks in order to facilitate trade and help the country to come out from the devastating impact of the world war and even any sort of the crisis or the negative balance of payment taking place in any of the country. Certain regional blocks were also taken into consideration like regional trading block of the Europe was taken into consideration predominantly European Union was emphasized in it. A regional trading block of America was also taken into consideration particularly NAFTA was taken in, into deep study. Regional trading block of Asia and Pacific region like ASARC and ASEAN and APAC have been discussed during that lecture. Regional trading block of Africa and Middle East Asia have also been covered into the discussion in the previous lecture. Now, today we are going to discuss the various international trade theories. We try to figure out how these different international trade theories are facilitating the trade among the different nations. Rather, these different trade theories are going to give you certain pattern of doing the business in different nations. These are certain rules which every country might be following in and, he and helping them to do the trade in an efficient manner. Now let us have an overview of international trade. So far you already understand the meaning of the trade. You have understood that whenever our trading is taking place between two countries, right? whenever a business dealing is taking place between two countries, some transaction or exchange of goods and services are taking place uh, between two different nations. When you are crossing your geographical boundaries and moving to other international market, it is going to come under the international trade. So, international trade has made a tremendous contribution to the development of less developed countries in the early 19th and the 20th century and even now this is happening in today's scenario. Economists have put forward several theories to explain the occurrence of the international trade and uh, these are actually the patterns. What these, uh, what these theories actually talk about? These theory talks about the patterns of doing business. This theory talks about the patterns of doing business in the international business that a particular internationalist or the uh, entrepreneurist has to keep in mind while doing the business with international market. Usually certain question arise when you are into some international business and you are going to question yourself what I am going to produce. You are going to see how much I should produce and with whom country I should do the trading. Such kind of the questions and the issues which are arising in the mind of the businessmen are very well explained in the different theories. Now let us begin with the different types of the international trade theory. There are two broad demarcation of international trade theory. One is the traditional theory, another one is the modern international trade theory. And let us begin with the first international trade, uh, traditional international trade theory and then within this lecture we will also be covering the modern international trade theory. So let us first look at what are the different kind of theories going to be covered under the international trade theory. So basically the international trade theory is going to cover the theory of mercantilism, the absolute advantage theory is going to be covered in it, comparative advantage theory is going to cover in it, it is actually the comparative cost advantage and absolute cost advantage theory and the uh, fourth one is factor endowment theory. Now let us begin with this first theory that is mercantilism. 
This theory of mercantilism was given by Thomas Moon and it was the mid of 16th century and it ranged from 1500 to 1800 that was the range of the different century it covers it keep on, on uh, existence for from 1500 uh, till 1800 it is one of the oldest theory since the human mankind or human civilization i think this theory was into practice and it is based on zero sum gain this theory which was given by thomas moon is based on what zero sum game now what is zero sum game that means one is getting benefit exporter is at benefit whereas importer is losing what importer is losing importer is losing currencies not here the here is the case is the gold what used to happen why it is stated as a zero sum game because here in this mercantilism theory what is explained that you should focus on more of export every country should focus on what more of export there should be more of export and least import that means they don't want this import to happen much so every next country is thinking in this perspective that I should have maximum export because what they consider that the primary goal is to increase the wealth of nation by acquiring the gold. So if they would be doing the export and what they will be getting in the return is the gold. That was the scenario in the uh, early in the mid of the 16th century. This was a scenario when where the people used to buy certain commodity against the gold so every country used to have certain reservoir of the gold and they want to increase this reservoir of the gold so it they assume gold as a measure of the country's wealth they find that this is how the country wealth is going to be measured if i am having huge reservoir of the gold i will be considered as a wealthy country if i am having less reservoir of the gold i will be considered as a poor country so the entire focus is on increasing the maximum export the country start increasing uh, the access or uh, having more of the gold by promoting export and discouraging the import which for sure is going to lead to the situation of surplus because in the balance of trade what we see in the balance of trade we see there are two main conditions and the third one is the equilibrium condition for sure but the two main conditions are the surplus yeah, there will be a surplus when when exports are more than your imports and another situation is going to be deficit where imports are more than your export and the equilibrium situation is exports equal import and this is the most ideal equation this is one of the most ideal equation in the balance of trade where you try to maintain the equilibrium so if the situation here is happening of what exports are increasing you are increasing exports and if you keep on increasing the export to have maximum gold and to make your country as a wealthy you will be ranging to which particular equation where exports are going to be more and that means a situation of surplus is going to arise so the pitfall of this theory did not recognize anything except the goal as a measure of the country's wealth this is one of the pitfall right so here every next perspective was revolving around having a reservoir of the gold which is not going to be possible as a other country will also look for the export so there will be a discouragement of the import and if in the entire market there is a scenario of discouragement of the import that nobody is going to buy your product then whom you whom you are going to sell your product because every next person is following the same theory every next person is into the export nobody want to import so there are certain criticism that later this theory was criticized by Adam Smith on the ground that wealth of the nation is determined on the basis of available of goods and services rather than just the gold. And he come up with his theory known as absolute cost advantage theory. Right? This is what we are going to discuss in the next slide. But before that, let us look at the Davis Hume's price species flow mechanism. What he stated, he strongly uh, criticized the mercantilism theory and what he stated that there are glitch in the theory. In the short run, you can have a feeling that your exports are 
helping you to gain the good gold reservoir for a short run period only but it is not going to be the case in the long run by only exporting and then importing what is what he wanted to say david hume that if you kept on doing the export you kept on getting the hold agar hum ye theory maan bhi lete hain that the people are into export only and they are getting good markets like there are some developing countries might be under developed nations they cannot have the capacity or the resources to do certain production so let us assume there are some country like a developed countries from the a developed a country and there are certain developing b country right so there are there is a trading taking place they are exporting the goods to them right they are accepting because they don't have any choice and uh, they have to uh, from the entire reservoir of the gold they have to give and pay uh, to the developed nations and developed nations are getting richer and richer because and the size and the uh, the reservoir of the gold is started decreasing right because you don't have a choice the reservoir will reservoir of the gold of the developing country will kept on decreasing because they are giving back to the developed nation okay fine this is happening this is a scenario is okay fine but this situation is only good in the short run situation this hold good only in short run when it comes to a long run there will be the problem of inflation in the long run what kind of problem is going to arise when you continue with the export and you kept on having a huge reservoir of the gold in your country your wealth start increasing ultimately there will be the overvaluation right and the currency value will start decreasing right there will be a devaluation in the currency because you have now access of money in your market access of money is floating in the market in that case also what is going to happen apart from this your currency market value will also increase because now you become a wealthy nation other situation can be your currency valuation start increasing in the market and when the currency valuation will start increasing in the market then your charges are going to be very costly then your charges the charge that you are going to charge from the developing country is going to be very costly because because the because of the inflation in your country the currency valuation has gone down the earlier you used to sell the product at 10 rupees now you are selling at the same product at the 30 rupees now it is going to be very costly for the developing country to bear that 20 rupees appreciation so there will be a decline in the clientage of your this is what david hume david hume come up with the price specific flow mechanism he strongly criticized the mercantilism theory and state that this equation is going to be successful only in a short run but when it comes to a long run you are going to start losing your market now let's look at the next theory next theory of absolute cost advantage which was given by adam smith in 1776 and what he stated that you should find out the absolute advantage in the goods and services you are in say for example you are good in the production of x product and uh, you are also producing some y product then discard the production of the y product for the sake of producing the x product in the market because you are having a absolute advantage in it right say for example uh, uh, let us uh, try to see the production taking place in two countries on a per day basis like japan is doing certain production and india is doing certain production and this is the output on a per day basis right of a labor this output is generating on a per day basis for a labor and this is happening in japan and india let us consider they are into the production of pen and audio tape recorder say for example japanese country uh, japanese people able to produce on a daily basis 20 pens wherein 60 pens are produced in india and 6 tape recorders are produced in japan and 2 tape recorders are produced in india so absolute advantage is where here it could be easily seen that in uh, for on a per day this is the chart of a per day basis just for the sake of understanding and better understanding i am assuming this example that japan is producing 20 pen and india is producing 60 pen on a per day basis an audio tape recorder is uh, six number of audio tape recorders are produced in japan and two audio two uh, uh, audio tape recorders are produced in 
India. So now what you will be seeing that for producing the 60 pen, how many more labor Japan needs to increase? That means Japan needs to have how many number of days to reach to this? That means in a day they can produce this much. That means they need two more days to make the production equivalent to the India. And in a similar case, what we can see that for the production of a audio tape equivalent to the Japan, India also need to increase the production and they need three more days to do the production equivalent to Japan. That means what Japan can do in one day, India needs to do it in three days as far as the audio tape recorder is concerned. And what India can produce in terms of the pen, India can produce 60 pens in one day where in case Japan need to produce 60 pen for this they need to have three days again they need to increase their production right they need to increase the number of the days then only they will be able to reach to this situation. So it is advisable to do, do the production in which you are having absolute cost advantage that means Japan should produce audio tape wherein India should produce pen because they are having absolute cost advantage they are having skill and efficiency in producing pen more faster than Japan and audio tape is um, more better produced in Japan as compared to India and more faster their resources their skill system and the entire setup is more good so it's ideally it is acceptable to do such kind of the production this is what the absolute cost advantage is all about identifying in which you are excellent the area in which you are excellent and continue the production of that now let's look at some of the theoretical aspects according to Adam Smith free trade enable a country to produce variety of goods and services uh, that's very obvious because of the free trade taking place between two nations. Now there is no fear of bearing the unnecessary custom duties and the charges. So let us figure out I am good in this, you are good in this, let's share the things with each other. Which good should I should be produced, which good should be imported is answered well by the Adam Smith. This is what the people presume that what ideally I should produce and what I should export is answered by this absolute advantage theory that on the basis of your, your production capacity on the basis of the skill set that you are having you can take a call you can take a decision that i will be producing audio tape or i will be producing the pen as per this theory is known as a positive sum game as in the previous case of the mercantilism we see that that was a zero sum gain that means one is gaining other party the who is the importer is not gaining anything but here in this case it's a win-win situation for both because at one side you are importing on the other side you are exporting so here in this case India is buying the audio tape and at the same time Japan is also buying the pen from India so it's a positive sum gain there is exchange taking place between the uh, two countries against currency not the gold here the mode of exchange or the mode of the transaction is based on the currency system not on the basis of the gold according to him every country should specialize in producing those product at cost less than that of the other country this is what we try to figure out on the basis of this example that if they are investing this much they could produce 20 pens on a daily basis and how much cost it is going to be for them to bear has to be analyzed well in advance which is going to be effective for that country to do the exporting of the commodity now how countries can have absolute advantage what are the parameters that are going to help a particular country to gain certain absolute advantage you must be having a skilled labor like in case of a Japan we see that people are highly uh, highly tech savvy they can do work more efficiently with the new advanced technology so this that level of the skill of people available in the Japan so work related to technology work related to the um, uh, the R&D can be easily done by the Japanese people the specialized resources you might be having certain resources which other country might not be having you might be having a varied climatical condition and because of the very climate conditions you have a huge assortment of natural resources which other country is not having right then in that case you will be considered for having a specialized resources for example Africa is very good in gold so they are exporting around 22 percent of the whole world gold to the uh, entirely different countries across the globe so that is the specialized resources in which particular area you are specialized what kind of the 
resources you are holding, you should use them. Economy of scale would increase the labor cost per unit, is going to reduce the labor cost per unit of the output. That is very obvious. The moment you gain efficiency in doing the production, the per unit cost is going to get reduced because you might be doing the production in the bulk and the same process is involved in doing the same production again and again, over and over again. What is going to happen? You are going to generate the excellency of doing the work and eventually the errors which used to happen in the previous days or the in the initial days of your work is going to to get overcome and you will be gaining the economy of scale natural advantage right you might be having some natural advantage because your geographical location is that you are so close to the your market your market is quite near to you or because of the natural resources that you are having that is a natural advantage you might be gaining an acquired advantage or those advantage which we actually acquire from somebody you might not be rich in those uh, resources or in in those area but it acquire certain resources from outside and then it, that's how it become an acquired advantage you buy certain technology technology from my uh, other country like India might not be having good technological advancement in the early 19th and 20th century. So what they used to do, they used to import the machinery and technology from foreign country like China and Japan and Korea. They used to buy the things from there and uh, so that they can gain the advantage of doing the production in India that is what known as acquired advantage. And, uh, there are certain assumptions also of uh, the absolute chaos advantage theory which has to be taken into consideration while uh, defining this theory right because it this here they are just talking about trading is taking place between two countries right that means trade is between two countries there there is no scope of multilateral agreements so or there is no scope of where the two and more than three countries are involved in it that means that this is one of the assumption uh, on the basis of this assumption the entire theory explanation is based only two commodities are traded they are not talking of uh, multiple uh, say there may be the this is a criticism also of the absolute cost advantage theory that there may be the possibility a country may be excellent in two commodity production right why you are just stating that country is only good in one that there may be the possibility the country is having excellence in two area then what will happen so that was a criticism and this is the assumption was uh, on the basis of which this entire theory was based free trade existence between the country right uh, so there is a free trade existence Free trade existence between the country that means they are believing on having a free trade among the countries. They are not into the process that there will be a custom duty and if there will be a custom duty this is going to discourage the idea of finding the product in which I am excellent. So that is also assumed that there will be a free trade, there will be no barriers right they have assumed there will be no barriers the only element of the cost of production here is considered as a labor again which is not true right this is not the only uh, factor of production the land is also the factor of production right uh, your capital is also the factor of production right yeah and uh, your entrepreneur entrepreneur the the person who is stating or initiating the business is also and the machinery that you are using technology that you are using is also a factor of production so this statement is also not holding true here that is why there are certain criticism no absolute advantage you may have a comparative there is no such possibility that I will be excellently good in one product and I am not good at all in other product so this is one of the criticism which this Adam Smith theory of absolute cost advantage face from David Ricardo and he come up with his comparative cost advantage theory the country size is also one of the aspect that depending upon the size of the country there will be a variation in the resources it, it is not only just one resource that you might be holding you might be having variety of the resources because of the size of the country larger the size of the country there will be the larger resources right like Germany is having less population and the, the size is good so they are using the land for the agriculture activity and the, because the size is good of the country the transportation cost is also going to be increased because you might have to re relocate your pr production from maybe South India to North India and then from North India is going to ship to the foreign country like Thailand, Indonesia or other places then you have to transport right. So transportation cost within the country and between the country is also be there and which is not considered into the absolute cost advantage theory. Scale economy is also not holding true because there will be a possibility of change in the taste and preferences of the customer and the market and if you keep on doing the monotonous things over and over again there will be a decline of the product then what 
will be the case of a company in that case. Absolute advantage for many products that means there is no absolute advantage and there is a possibility of absolute advantage in many products. Now let us look at the comparative advantage which will help you to understand this concept. Comparative cost advantage given by David Ricardo in 1817 and he is the one who actually come up with all these criticism of the absolute cost advantage and try to overcome these problem in his theory and he, he, he even gave the reference of opportunity cost theory. What he stated that absolute cost advantage theory failed to explain the situation when one country has absolute advantage in producing many product. Say for example, I am good in producing pen or as well as I am good in producing audio tape. Now how I should take a call, which particular product I should produce and which particular product I should not, I am failed to understand because earlier in the absolute cost advantage theory, it was very clearly presumed like in the previous slide I can show you that it was very clearly presumed and that I am good in producing uh, this uh, tape, I am in pr producing audio tape, Japan and India is good in producing pen. So this is very clear in this picture. However, this picture is not going to be clear when you are having uh, expertise or excellency in producing both pen and audio tape. You are excellent in producing both of them. Then which particular product to be produced and which should not be produced, what to be exported, what should be imported. Now the question is not clear as per the absolute uh, cost advantage theory. That is why this uh, David Ricardo theory came into the picture. David Ricardo expanded the absolute cost advantage theory to clarify the situation and develop a theory of comparative cost advantage. This theory states that country should produce an export product for which it is relatively more productive than the other country and import the good which is which other country are relatively productive than it is. That means you need to find out in which particular production of a product my cost of production is going to be less right which is going to be seems to be more productive for my organization for my country I am going to continue the production of that and the other product which seems to be less productive for me I will not be making the production of that right. So this theory is based on relative productivity difference incorporate the concept of opportunity cost as well. So before we talk about the opportunity cost let me just quickly give you an example like the example earlier I have framed that on a per day basis if uh, Japan is making a production of uh, pan and audio tape let us look at that example from different perspective they are producing pan and audio tape recorders these are the audio tape recorders they are producing and the output is being generated on a per day basis per labor right. So uh, if Japan is producing in 60 pens and 60 audio tape recorders and here in case let us assume 50 pen India is producing and 2 audio tape recorder India is producing. So here what we are finding that Japan is good in producing both the commodities. They are good in producing pen as well as they are good in producing the audio tape recorders. Now which particular product to be produced for this you need to understand the difference between the two kind of the production. Here what we will see that if I am going to produce 60 comparatively how much I am better. So here I am just 10 pen ahead of India. And if I will be going for the production of audio tape, how much I am producing that, that is 6 and as compared to India how much I am ahead that is 4. So that means if I will continue with the production of the audio tape, it is going to be more, it is going to give me more comparative cost advantage as compared to the pen because here the difference is very less where in this case the difference is comparatively high and they need to have good technology they need to improve their infrastructure for reaching to this level of the production which I am doing and by the time they will reach to this I will be efficient and I might have gained economy of scale I will be able to produce the product at more cost effective manner. So I should go for the production of pen rather than the sorry I should go for the uh, Japan should go for the production of audio tape rather than the pen and India should go for the production of pen right. So this is on the basis of comparative cost advantage you try to 
figure it out comparatively where I am getting more benefit as compared to the country where I will be uh, uh, launching or uh, exporting my product. So, they are sacrificing this alternative for the sake of the production of audio tape in India. That is why it is stated the theory is based on relative productivity difference and incorporate the concept of opportunity cost. That, that is that this opportunity cost was given by Habler's opportunity cost theory and Gottfried Habler gave the theory of opportunity cost. Opportunity cost is the value, the most valuable choice, right? Is the cost is the value of the most valuable choice from those which are not taken, right? How much I have to pay if I will not choose this particular option or the choice. It expressed the basic relation between choice and the scarcity because I am having limited resources. I cannot make the choice of selecting all the options and all the choices in my hand. I have to sacrifice one for the sake of accepting the other choice, right? I might be having limited money in my hand, right? I am having limited labor in my country. So, I can either have a production of a pen or the audio tape, right? So, if I have to make a choice, then I will be doing the comparative study that which particular production is going to be more beneficiary for me. So, I as a Japanese country find out that uh, production of audio tape is going to be more beneficiary for me. So, I will continue with the production of it and I will sacrifice the production of the pen, right. So, whatever the, the cost of this uh, sacrifice is, is going to be my opportunity cost, right. This is what mentioned here in the second paragraph, opportunity cost theory explain if a country produce, if a country can produce either commodity X and Y. That means they can produce X is a pen and Y is your audio tape, if they can produce both. Japan country can produce pen uh, 60 in number a day and audio uh, 6 audio tapes in a day. So, opportunity cost of a commodity X, the amount of other commodity Y that must be given up in order to the additional unit of the X. That means, if I want to produce the additional unit of the Y, then I have to sacrifice the production of this X commodity that is the pen because for every additional unit of production of an audio tape, I need to have resources, I need to have a land, I need to have a labor, right. So, uh, I am having a limited resources of the labor, then I will be placing my labor from the unit of the pen unit to the audio tape unit. So, for the additional unit of production of this audio tape that is a Y commodity, I need to sacrifice the production of the pen. This is what the opportunity cost and the David Ricardo took the reference of this opportunity cost for explaining his comparative cost advantage theory. There are certain assumptions which have to be taken into consideration the way there were certain assumptions of the absolute cost advantage theory. So, there are what are those assumptions? There will be a full, full employment, right? That means my all labors are fully utilized, 100 percent job is there. There is no such labor who is left without any job. That means full employment is there. If there is a full employment, then I have to make use of these existing worker in different jobs. That is why they are trying to find out that which particular commodity to be produced, X commodity or the Y commodity. The only element of cost of production is the labor here again and the production and is the subject to the law of constant returns. Right, there is no concave curve in the graph of it, there is going to be the constant returns. There are no trade barriers, this is what they are believing that there will be no trade barrier and the free cost of production is taking place. Trade is free from any sort of the cost of production because you are finding the least cost producing area. Trade take place only between two countries, only two products are traded and there are no cost of the transportation. So, whatever the things may going to deviate the analysis of the comparative cost theory has been taken up in the assumption. There was the criticism that comparative cost advantage theory is an improvement for sure. This is a step ahead of the absolute cost advantage theory that is true. But this theory failed to take the reference of the money value. Say for example, well, uh, the production that you are doing in Japan is costing you X and when it comes to exported to India, it become X by 2. That means as 
as we all know that Indian currency 1 rupee is against 1.91 Japanese yen. So, just for the sake of understanding let us suppose that 1 rupee is equals to 2 yen that is a Japanese currency. And let us assume the Japan wage system of the labor is 360 rupees right. And uh, here we assume in India the wage is 100 rupees. Let us take the old example again and try to see the comparative cost advantage theory from the perspective of the money. Japan, India and uh, this is the slab for pen production, audio tape recorders they are producing. They are making production here 60 and they are making production 6, 50 and they are producing 2 right. These were the figures taken here itself and now I am taking the same figures here. Right, so let us now consider that if I need to the cost of producing the pen. Now, let us see the cost of producing pen in Japan, how much it is going to cost you. That is 360 upon 60, right. So, it is going to cost you somewhere, right, 6 rupees. And the cost of production of audio tape in Japan is going to be your 6, 360 and the audio tape is 6, right. So, here it is going to be 60 for you and India is 100 rupees. So, in case of a pen, they will be producing, in case of the audio tape, it is 100 by 2 that is going to be 50. So, here what is mentioned that you are not considering the value of the money as you are taking the decision of producing the audio tape as per the previous analysis that I should go for the production of the audio tape then as per this money value it is going to cost you this much where in case the pen is going to cost you only 6. So, the entire analysis got twisted and turned to 180 degrees Celsius that instead of producing audio tape, the country like Japan should continue with the production of the uh, uh, pen rather than this because it is going to cost them much because there is a currency convertibility charges also the country has to wear. The money value is also going to be involved. We have for the sake of understanding, we have considered it is 1 rupee against uh, uh, 1 rupee is equal to 2 Japanese yen. So, this is going to be very costly for the person and in case of India also, it is going to be a point of concern. If they would be producing the pen, it is going to be more cheaper for them for sure and when they will be producing the audio tape, it is going to be very costly for them. Let us talk about the another very important theory that is the relative factor endowment theory which is which is talking about the various factors of production to be taken into consideration when you are taking a call of deciding which particular product to be produced. So, this is the fourth type of the traditional international trade theory. As per this uh, trade theory, the factor of endowment theory, the land, cap capital, natural resources, la labor and the climate is taken into consideration as a factors of production. And it was given by Hacksher and Olin. Olin was the student of Hacksher and it, it came into the practice and the purpose of this particular theory is to emphasize on various factors of production while taking a call of deciding which particular product to produce. It should not be like that you are taking a decision of producing a pen, but you do not have the sufficient resources to do the do so. Say for example, India take a decision of producing the audio tape, but they do not have a technology with them. So, they need to import the technology first importing of technology is going to be very costly for them right the, it is going to increase the price of the audio tape so it is required to understand which particular resources you are good in and on the basis of the availability of the resources you should take the call of deciding which particular product to be produced so it's a land labor relationship if you are having a huge size of the land right huge size of the land then you should make the production which is requiring more of land 
right like uh, the agriculture activities should be uh, initiated when you are having huge land you have your size of the country is quite big population is comparatively low so it's better to make use of the land in a better way to make maximum out of the land available in your country if in case you are uh, labor intensive your country is quite rich in the labor then you should look for some labor intensive work then the technology which it, which it is required right so labor intensive but there is a lint of paradox which is state and which he stated in his study when he was studying the us market what he observed the in uh, us market and the developed nations are very rich in capital they can hire the labor very easily as they are very rich in capital they can have better skill worker but still they are outsourcing the worker that is the lint of paradox technological complexity is technological complexity that you are uh, capital intensive you are having very good advanced technologies then you should go for some capital intensive work or you should go for some technology intensive work where the in, or full automation or machineries are required right so there are certain technological complexities which have to be taken care of you should find out the mechanism how you are going to make your tech technology uh, easy uh, user friendly so that the work can be done with uh, with minimum manpower requirement so this is the relative factors of endowment theory given by Hatcher and Olin now we are heading towards the modern international trade theory the modern international trade theory is having four different dimensions like country similarity theory will be covered, product life cycle theory, new trade theory and national competitive advantage theory will also be covered in this modern international theory. So far we had discussed the traditional international trade theory. Now the country similarity theory which was given by Stephen Linder in 1916 what he means to state with this that uh, and rather he tried to oppose the Hacksher Rowland theory that just we started Hacksher Rowland theory this is H and O theory which is also known as factor endowment theory also known as two factor theory was uh, opposed by Stephen Linder in his theory of country similarity what he stated that deciding which particular product I should produce is not purely going to be based on the factors of production that I am having there are other factors should also be taken into consideration while deciding which particular product to be produced like the country similarity theory he started talking of there should be the similarity in the country there should be the similarity in terms of the location similarity in terms of culture similarity in terms of the economy similarity in terms of the political and economic interests among the different nations is also going to be the criteria to be taken into consideration while you are deciding to have a trade with international market right he international trade take place among the country that are of the same stage of economic development right the country who are in different stage of the development there may be a possibility the trade may not take place and they took the example of the technology the developed nations are only transferring the technology from developed nation to develop another developed nation when the technology was just introduced new technology when there is a new technology in the market it will be shared only among developed nations right none because why it is not shared to the developing nation because it is going to be very expensive for developing country to afford the price of the technology so from that perspective what he stated that uh, they the trading is taking place between the country or of the similar economic condition the economic similarity is there second is the on the basis of the location the trading may take place like regional trade blocks are formed from this perspective only the countries living together they form the block and start doing trading with each other the SARC is formed from the perspective of this that nearby countries let's come together ASEAN is formed with the nearby countries let's come together NAFTA is formed nearby countries let's come together to do the business so that's a similarity on the location and most of the time what it is observed those who are clear nearby or the neighbor country more or less have a culture similar to your country so it become easier for you to launch the product in a country with little deviations with little alterations so so you are going to get the advantage of uh, you are going to get the advantage the cost advantage when you are offering the more or less same product in the nearby neighbor countries because there is no requirement of bringing the change because of the locational advantage you are getting the similarity in the culture like HUL in India what they are doing they are doing the production in India but uh, uh, after doing production in India what they are doing they are transferring it to different nation nearby to it like Bangladesh they are doing they are transferring it to Nepal they are transferring it to Bhutan so because of the country similarity 
right the locational similarity nearby neighbor countries of india i and i'm finding they are more or less similar in the taste and preferences with those of the india so i'll be doing the production here in india with slight modification in the packaging and other promotion techniques i can offer to bangladesh nepal and bhutan another is the political economics interest if the the countries are having same political interest like the country having capitalistic political system and uh, you are also belonging to a country of a capitalistic system that means there will be less intervention of the government and if there will be less intervention of the government what is going to happen it is going to be easier to for you to do the cross trading with each other so the political economic interest is also become a prime concern for deciding which particular country i should enter so it's not just factor of production it, these also uh, these uh, similarities of the country also pave the way for deciding in which particular country to be selected and which not to be as per the stephen linder in 1961 the next type of the um, the modern international trade theory is the theory of product life cycle and it was given by raymond vernon in 1960 and this product life cycle theory is going to revolve around four of these different stages and these four different stages are going to give you a clear idea at which particular stage what i should do initially when product is introduced let's look at the graph of this of plc right so initial stage is going to be the launch of the product and then there is going these are the four different stages this is your introduction stage this is the growth stage this is the maturity stage of the product and this is the decline stage of the product so if usually new development innovation invention take place in developed nations why it is happening so because they are rich in r&d as they are rich in r&d they are into good experimentation they have good labs to do it the government is also very supportive their skill manpower is also there which require the analysis and analyzing which what new can come up say for example if uh, uh, the technology is launched right like the advanced technology is launched it is not going to be straight away launched into a developing nation so it is first going to be there in the developed nations only because the cost of the production is going to be so high at that point of time so it is going to confine to the uh, home, the developed nations their home country or the different developed nations but initially it is not going to be why because you are already investing lot of money in making your product to exist and survive in your home country but the moment you able to gain the acceptance and the market share you start moving from the introductory stage to which particular stage the growth stage your product move from introductory to the growth stage that means this is the time where you are having good market share and the market growth is also taking place at a very fast pace here in the introduction stage the market share is very low market share is low right is very low market growth rate is there market growth rate is there but your market share is low here in this case of the growth your market share is going to increase and growth rate is also there market growth rate is also high right so because of this equation it become possible for you to now start exploring and expanding your product to different parts of the country itself or to the nearby or neighbor countries that's a growth stage eventually your product is going to move from growth stage to the maturity stage here now what is going to happen you have a maximum market share you can't expect to have anything more than that but market growth rate start going down market growth rate start going down now this is not the right time to invest a single penny on such kind of the product if you would be still investing in the same product there is a possibility of your money to get stuck up there so this is the time to get 
the returns on whatever the investment you've been putting in the growth stage or the this growth stage and the introductory stage whatever the money have been invested this is the time to get the returns you will be getting returns from your product and eventually your product is going to get decline in your market and now the product as the product decline that means market share is market share is now going to down is becoming near to zero right market growth rate is also zero because there may be the possibility somebody else has come up with some new advancement new technology in your area so there is a decline and if it is a case of a developed country innovators then the moment my product get decline here in developed country i will move to where various developing countries i will move to developing country like india right i'll move to there from america my product will move to india because now in my home country this product has lost its value and it is an absolute decline and over the period of the time a lot of development had took place and technology also become cheaper and uh, for the developed nation but it is and at the same time it become affordable for the developing countries so this product life cycle is talking about the various different stages at the different stages you are going to take a call which particular market to enter into if you are in the new product introduction you will be just confining yourself to home country the moment you move to the growth nation growth stage that means you start getting some acceptance from other foreign uh, countries you start your demand start generating in the foreign market because you are doing incredibly well in your home country you start looking for or some other foreign market also so you may expand to only but the developed nation the country of the same economic uh, uh, situation or the sa same similarity in the economy you need to take into consideration while you are moving from your growth stage to other different countries majority of the product is going to let you know that this is not the time to invest any further money in it and this is the time to take the returns and find out which particular market i can explore by the time my product get declined in my market so the money you are getting from the mature product is going to be utilized to find new product to launch in the new in the existing market and the, at the same time how i can make use of this old product in the new market right so with at this particular stage you are actually trying to find out one very important thing that old product new market and that new market is going to be developing countries or under developed countries and the money which you are getting is going to find out that how to produce the new product for the existing market that is your own developed nation so this this uh, these different questions usually arise when your product reach to the maturity and it is about to decline so how to make use of the fund which is coming from this uh, the cash cow kind of a product which is coming to me how i'm going to make use of this uh, money to find out the best possible measure before the decline of my product comes so this is about the product life cycle theory given by Raymond Vernon in 1960 now let us move to the new trade theory new trade theory is going to talk about three important factors and it was given by Paul Krugman in 1980s and he is talking predominantly about three areas one is economy of scale product differentiation and first mover advantage so uh, economy of scale is when you are gaining efficiency in the production when you gain efficiency in the production what is going to happen you are going to gain cost advantage that means your per, per unit cost of production is going to go down because you are excellent efficient in making the production in one particular product over and over year you are doing the same production so you become so trained to make the production so economy of scale is going to make you an excellent in one area and that can be used as a new trade Uh, new trade of opportunity for you that can generate a new trade opportunity because you are excellent in one area other there could be a product differentiation in the whole market they are dealing with one x product but you come up with the x dash which is very new for the market and if you have come up with little or slight differentiation in the market like samsung come up with the four, um, that uh, 
the mobile phone which can be folded and can be turned into a small size pocket size so that is a differentiation right so they come up with the folding uh, phone so that is the product differentiation we come up with and you become you get the first mover advantage also you get the first mover advantage also when you are seeing there uh, they they are you are offering certain product which is very unique you are offering certain product which is not common in the whole market so you take the advantage of it and you start initiating your launch of the product in the foreign market so that is the first mover advantage that means you initiate first you become the first one to come up with this idea and you launch to the whole world that is a first mover advantage so if any country having any of these uh, uh, factors of uh, doing the business right they can uh, export their product to the foreign market this is the new trade theory another uh, theory which was given by potter's national competitive advantage theory in the year 1990 he talk about four major dimensions and on the basis of that you can take a call whether to go into international market or not so first you have to assess the factor condition you have to see what kind of the resources i need are these resources there or not right if these resources are there then i should move to that country or if those things are not there then i'll be confining myself to find some other country where i can get those things the other thing for going into international market is a demand condition whether the country is having a demand of the product which i am going to produce in the host country if it is so go for the international market and if it is not then i have to find other market where the demand exists or else you have to have the understanding that if it is not so demand is not there but i am sure with the kind of product which i will be producing will ultimately generate a demand in the market like the elon musk ideology of coming with the e vehicles there was no demand but eventually the people start demanding for such kind of the product you need to also see that the uh, relating and supporting industry presence in the host country right the kind of the raw material you may be need of like america never stop the production of silicon for supplying it to the computer industry so if you are related to that and you need some supply of silicon you need some supply of gla glasses then you need to see whether the country uh, the industry is equipped enough to provide you the required raw material to do the production there or not then if the answer is yes go for it otherwise don't go for it another uh, the ad, uh, factors given by the michael potter is firm strategy structure and rivalry that what kind of uh, the political system what kind of political risk prevailing over there the uh, hierarchy system in prevailing in the organization and the level of the competition in that country is also going to be the determinant whether to go into a host country or not so altogether lee michael potter in the national competitive advantage theory emphasize on four factors that is the factor condition that is factors of production availability in the host country demand condition availability in the host country raw material supplier in the host country and the political system political risk the firm structure strategies and the competition level in the host country are going to be the major determinant before taking a call of entering into the host market now let's quickly review what we did in today's lecture in today's lecture we talk about certain traditional international trade theory the mercantilism absolute comparative cost advantage and the factor endowment theory and we also talked about certain modern international theory like country similarity product life cycle new trade and michael potter's competitive advantage theory i hope you all have understood these are the reference book which i referred while uh, giving this lecture to you thank you so much all the best for your future Hello and welcome to this piece of literary snippet. We usually know William Shakespeare as the most revered figure in the history of English literature. But we often tend to forget that he has also been one of the most hated figures in literature. 
And here I'm not talking only about those boys and girls who have to memorize uh, long sections from Macbeth or King Lear or Julius Caesar uh, before they can go and sit for their school and, or college exams. But I'm also talking about people who are themselves quite famous authors. Tolstoy, for instance, considered the writings of Shakespeare to be, and I quote, crude, immoral, vulgar, and senseless.